Hello. It's 10 o'clock on the 21st of April, 2022. My name is Jonathan Greenstein, and welcome to today's webinar, Key Changes to the FCA Authorization Process, presented by ComplyBot. With the recent publication of their strategy, the FCA are renewing their efforts to become a more innovative, more assertive, and more adaptive regulator. This is making the already challenging process of achieving FCA authorization even more difficult. As per the aforementioned published strategy, the FCA has stated that one in seven authorization applications are being refused, rejected, or withdrawn by firms, whereas previously this proportion was actually one in 13. <clears throat> firms submitting for direct authorization with the FCA will have their application met with a stronger authorizations gateway, featuring increased scrutiny and higher standards for authorization. These stricter conditions are in line with the FCA strategy for 2022 and their core goals of dealing with problem firms, reducing harm from firm failure, improving oversight of appointed representatives, and reducing and preventing financial crime. On today's webinar, we aim to provide a practical guide for firms planning to submit an FCA authorization uh, application in 2022 and 2023. During today's webinar, we will provide an update uh, on the FCA's approach to authorization, discuss what it means in practice to be ready, willing, and organized, review the FCA's threshold conditions for authorization, consider the FCA's principles for business, cover changes to the FCA's authorization fee structure, and outline the changes to the capital requirements firms need to be regulated. Today's presentation will be delivered by two of ComplyPort's senior team. The presenters are Richard Corbin, Director of Authorizations, and Panayotis Antoniou, Head of Risk Management and Prudential Services. Prior to joining ComplyPort, Richard spent in excess of 20 years working for the FCA, including as a manager in the Authorizations Division and leading, amongst others, the changing control and passporting teams. Before that, Richard was a manager of the FCA's Complaint Scheme and the Regulatory Decisions Committee, RDC, um, during which he held and led responsibility for managing the FCA's relationship with the Independent Complaints Commissioner. <clears throat> Paniotis is the Head of Risk Management of Prudential Services within Compliant Board. He leads a team that assists firms with financial reporting, Preparation, the preparation of ICARAs and advice on prudential regulations and their impact on financial services firms. Paniotis has extensive experience in the financial services sector with expertise in risk consulting to regulated entities. Now, at ComplyPort, we are specialist regulatory compliance and financial crime consultants. Our team are expert in FCA authorizations, having successfully assisted in over 1,000 of these, day-to-day -day compliant and regulatory support, and assisting firms in meeting the requirements of and implementing new regulation. In addition to these services, Compliant would also provide a reg tech solution to firms that supports them with compliance monitoring, the management of documentation, and the internal liaising required for sign-off of financial promotions or gift entertainment, all in an audit-driven environment. Now, before we begin properly, I'd like to cover a couple of brief housekeeping points. Either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on how you have it configured, you may see a button called Q&A. If you have any questions, please ask them in there, and we'll try to get through as many as we can at the end of today's session. Please, if you can, do not post the questions into the chat function, as this will not be being monitored. Now, with this in mind, before we jump into the actual presentation, we'd like to, to ask a couple of polls of our audience. So bear with me two seconds. The first poll, have you prepared an application to be submitted to the FCA for direct authorization? And if so, how difficult was the process? Now we'll launch the poll. It's a one to five answer, uh, one being very easy, five being very difficult. So if we can give it a couple of moments for people to start submitting their answers in, and then I will go through the data in, in due course. <clears throat> we have uh, almost 50% of responses. Now we'll give it just a couple more moments. Okay, let's close this off now, end the poll and share the results. 
So as you can see, um, one person found it very easy and several, a couple of people found it a little bit less easy than that. The majority of people found it within the three to four categories. So ranging from you know, a bit difficult to mildly difficult and some people did find it very difficult indeed. So we'll stop sharing that. And it takes me two seconds. We have two more polls. Second one. So, are you are you planning to submit an FCA application for direct authorization? And if you are, what are the areas that concern you most? If you give me two seconds, we'll launch this poll here. This is a multiple choice answer. So, if you can please select the areas that. Um, you would find most difficult um, and you think you may need assistance with. We will uh, give it a few moments and get people to, uh, to start putting these answers in here. I'm also very aware that we have quite a few answers to pick from, so it may take people a few minutes to read through the different results available. Give it a couple more moments just to let a few more answers in. Okay, so we've got almost 50% um, people responding, and we'll end the poll now. We'll share the results. So it does seem to be the two most, uh, the areas of most concern seem to be the preparation of the regulatory business plan and the preparation of the necessary prudential documentation. Uh, following that, it's gonna be responding to FCA queries per submission. That's an area that we've seen people needing a lot of support with and also identifying the right forms to complete. And if you can bear with me, we have one final poll to, to put, to put um, on the screen here before we pass across to Richard. Are you considering, it, considering submitting an application to the FCA for direct authorization within the next 12 months? So if you give me a second, we'll put this on here. This is a much easier one to respond to. Yes, no, or not applicable. So let's just wait and get some time to get these uh, answers in here. <clears throat> Give it a, a bit more time. We're, just, we're actually well over 50% of people now responding. Uh, let's see if we can go past almost 65 percent all right we'll pause it here so let's end the poll now and share the results and yeah overwhelmingly actually a lot of people on this webinar 54 percent of people who responded to this it was about almost 70 percent of people on this webinar today uh, are saying yes they are looking at going through an authorization uh, within the next year so it's interesting to know and hopefully the information that you um, will find from this webinar will actually help you in doing that. So thank you to everyone who responded to these polls. Uh, with these results in mind, I would like to now invite my uh, colleague Richard Corbin uh, to please start today's discussion. Richard, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan, and um, good morning, everybody. Um, so this is, as the slide suggests here, the first part of this morning's um, webinar, which in itself is probably neatly divided into, into two distinct parts. So what I'm going to do um, in the first three bullet points that are listed there is um, cover the fundamentals of, of FCA authorization. So looking at uh, in turn of what it means to be ready, willing and organized, then the, the FCA's threshold conditions, and finally its principles for business. Um, once I've done that, I'll go on to have a look at um, what's going on in the authorization space at the moment. So the, the changes and the challenges that we are seeing happening um, in, 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 the, in the world of authorizations, um, a brief mention of the changes that have recently been made to the authorization fee structure. Um, and then I'm going to spend a brief amount of time just, just saying, uh, covering some, some points, looking ahead at what we think is, is coming down the line. So, Jonathan, moving on to the, um, the next slide, please. Um, this is the beginning of the, um, the, the three areas that I want to cover around the fundamentals of FCA authorization. So with the 54% with of you that are saying um, that you are looking to make an application to the FCA within the next 12 months, 
hopefully this information will be um, of, of key interest to you. And, and for, for others who are perhaps not in that space, then hopefully this will be a useful reminder of what the authorization process looks like. So I'm going to start off here with the, the question of what ready, willing and organised means um, in, in the world of the FCA. Um, obviously, it's safe to say that we all understand exactly what these, these three simple words mean um, in day to day usage. But what about in an FCA authorisations context? The, the concept of demonstrating to the FCA that you're ready, willing and organised to be authorised is, is absolutely key. It's probably the most basic of, of the FCA's expectations, um, but it's fundamental and it's something that firms must get right. Uh, it must be reflected in and throughout the firm's application. So we've got some examples here on the slide of, of the sorts of things um, that reflect a firm's ready, willing and organized status at the, at the authorization stage. But let's have a, a, a bit of a closer look at um, what sorts of things uh, the FCA has said about um, how it gauges um, whether firms meet these criteria. So on, on the FCA's website, it talks about the, um, the, the applicant firm demonstrating that it takes regulation seriously in the authorization process. Um, it wants to be sure that firms applying to it are ready, willing and organized to comply with their rules and requirements at all times, and sets out the expectation that firms have planned how they will meet the standards of the regulatory system before they apply. Looking at each of these um, briefly in turn, the FCA says that in, in terms of readiness, there are some um, positive indicators that it might be looking for when it's beginning to engage with firms in the authorization space. So firstly, is the firm looking at information on its website? Um, if necessary, is there evidence that it's making uh, inquiries of the FCA's contact center? and engaging with the FCA in, in, in that way. Um, another positive indicator is, is that the firm has clearly been seeking legal or compliance advice in the course of preparing its application for authorization. But for me, I think that the, the key point in terms of readiness um, is around the, the firm's ability to clearly articulate its regulatory obligations. Um, now, this doesn't mean you know, that at some point the, the, the managing director of the firm should be able to stand up and recite everything um, chapter and verse, but I think this really comes into play when the FCA starts to engage with the firm once the application has been submitted, and we'll come on to that a bit more later. But in summary here, um, once the dialogue around the authorization starts, is it clear to the FCA that the firm understands what its obligations are going to be going forward. Moving on to the question of, of willingness, I think the, um, the, the, the interesting point here on the FCA's website is that it says it will consider the attitude of the applicant during the authorizations process. Um, and positive indicators here will include being open and honest in all dealings, being proactive about getting information to the FCA, um, demonstrating initiative to understand regulatory duties and timeliness around availability of staff to deal with questions about the application. And just as a, a brief aside here, I think this is all quite interesting in terms of setting the tone. Um, the FCA is no longer in a position where it sort of is comfortable with a firm submitting a poor application uh, in the expectation that the FCA will then guide them through the process thereafter. Um, particularly in the space of being ready, willing and organised, the FCA is now expecting um, that applications that come into them are pretty tight, that, that everything is in place and everything is good to go. We'll, we'll come on to that more later on. So finally, in, in, in terms of the question of being organised, um, the sorts of things here that the FCA is going to be interested in is around the supporting documentation having been prepared and having been submitted. And it was interesting to note in the poll a second ago that I think um, in terms of the sort of difficulty factors that people have faced in the past, the, the key points played back to, 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 to us in the poll there were um, firstly identifying the relevant forms for submission and then secondly um, preparing those forms. Ready, willing and organised um, doesn't just end at the point at which the application is submitted. It, it will carry on, that theme will carry on throughout 
the authorizations process and, and the FCA makes that clear on its website as well. So once your application is in and we come on to the question of questions from the FCA itself, um, they are going to continue to be gauging um, where the firm is in relation to, um, to, to, to those three criteria. So that's a, a sort of brief coverage of the, um, the ready, willing and organised side of things. Um, once the, um, the, the application has, has been prepared and has been submitted, um, obviously the next stage is going to be for the FCA to then assess the application. Um, and so the next part of the, um, the, the next part of the process here is going to be the FCA's assessment of the firm against the threshold conditions for authorization. So thank you, Jonathan, for, for taking us on to, to the next slide. There's a couple of slides here dealing with threshold conditions. So firstly, I'm gonna take a brief canter through the what. So we're gonna have a reminder of what the threshold conditions for authorization are and, and, and have a slightly closer look at what sits beneath those. And then I'll go on to um, talk a bit more about um, the how. So how it is that the FCA is then assessing firms once it's looking at applications. So as it says here on the slide, essentially the, the, the threshold conditions are the minimum standards that the FCA has for a firm to be authorised. Um, most firms seeking entry into the regulated arena are going to encounter these as part and parcel of their application. Um, I say most because as the FCA takes on um, more and more different sectors, there is some variation around um, requirements for authorization, but I think at this, for, for the purposes of the webinar, it's safe to say that most firms um, will encounter these and, and, and these will apply in the context of, of an application. So have, let's have a quick look at each of these um, in turn, if we may. So starting with location of offices, um, you know, this sounds pretty obvious, but it isn't just the question of bricks and mortar. So the, the, the requirement under the location of offices condition is that the firm must have its head office in the UK. Um, but this goes beyond the, the mere question of, you know, what the address is or where the building is, those sorts of things. So in, in particular here, the FCA is concerned about the question of what it calls the mind and management of the firm, the location of the, uh, the firm's directors and senior managers who are taking day-to-day -day decisions about the firm's central direction. Obviously, post-COVID, we're, we're, we're in a brave new world now. We've, we've had a lot of um, flexible working, a lot of working from remote locations. And as the dust settles on all of that, it's going to be interesting to see what sort of um, view the FCA takes on um, hybrid arrangements and perhaps more flexible arrangements. But as things stand at the moment, um, the, the, the threshold condition here uh, around location of offices remains unchanged. Secondly, effective um, supervision. And, and in, in summary here, what the FCA is interested in is the question of whether there are any obvious barriers um, to the FCA's ability to supervise the firm should it become authorised. Um, for the most part, this is going to have a degree of overlap with the, the location of offices condition. Um, so, you know, where is the, the firm operating from? Would the FCA, if it needed to, be able to um, regularly pay or routinely pay a visit to the firm's office if it needed to carry out um, a supervision visit, for example? Would it find the relevant records and resources um, at that address? But also beyond that, um, the FCA will look at the question of whether, for example, there's anything about the, the nature of the wider group structure and the arrangements that, that sit across both the firm and any group that it may part, be part of that, that might hinder um, the, the ability of the FCA to, to supervise that firm once it's authorised. Thirdly, uh, we have the condition of appropriate resources. Um, I think the risk that we sometimes see here is that people see the word resources and automatically think, okay, this is obviously just dealing with the question of the financial arrangements that the firm has in place. And clearly, yes, the FCA is, is keen to understand what exactly is, is going on there and to be sure that the firm will be solvent, will have sufficient capital and, and liquid resources available to it on an ongoing basis. And, and, and that's part of the um, equation here. But also in terms of resources, um, the FCA will be focusing on 
um, the, the non-financial resources, so knowledge, skills, and experience, looking at, at, at the staff, the key staff that will be within the firm, and making sure that those are the right sorts of people who can make the firm run in the way that it says it's going to. Suitability um, is probably the one that is most um, familiar to, to, to those of us who've sort of been kicking around in regulation for any period of time. So it, it really sort of talks to the fit and proper um, test, the fit and proper side of things that, that we're familiar with. Um, the, the FCA will be looking at um, factors here, such as any information that ought to be disclosed to it um, to help them to understand the suitability of the key individuals who will be running the firm. Have those disclosures been made? Have those disclosures been full? Has the firm demonstrated a willingness um, to provide that information? And finally, on, on, on business model, um, increasingly here, the, the, the FCA is starting to look at the, the holistic picture. So. Um, what I'm driving at here is that it's quite common, of course, for firms to, to have a hybrid situation where part of its activity is regulated, um, other parts are not regulated. So the FCA will want to understand what it is exactly that the firm is proposing to do, what other activities go on in the firm, what's the sort of scale of um, proposed activity, who are going to be the clients in all of this, what is the scope for potential harm? Um, and very briefly, just looking at the question of firms that carry on both regulated and unregulated business, um, is there a risk either of some sort of halo effect? So if, um, if a firm is going to be authorised, does it seem likely that it will look to transfer its, its, its FCA badge across to the business that isn't covered by the FCA? And also, what are the likely implications? So if one side of the business fails, particularly if the unregulated side of it were to um, to, to go down, what impact might that have on clients? So on to the next slide, please, Johnny, which looks at um, the how. So what is actually happening once an application is, has been put in uh, and the FCA is starting to, um, to gauge the, the application, if you like. So the, the, the first thing here, the vast majority of applications will be subject to some sort of human scrutiny in the form of, a, of an FCA case officer. Um, the FCA has dis indicated that it is, is moving towards greater digitization, um, but for now, you, you know, for the most part, you can expect your application to land on the desk of somebody who will be looking at it, going through it, and assessing the case against the threshold conditions. And every case will be, dis will, will, will be looked at on its own merits. Inevitably, um, there will be questions coming back from the FCA on the application. And obviously the, the um, question of ready, willing and organised comes back into play here. Um, it is true to say that sometimes it can feel uh, like there, there is perhaps an inconsistency of approach because questions that might get asked in one application don't then get asked in, in something similar further down the line. Um, but that's completely understandable in my view. So assessment against threshold conditions quite rightly is not just a one size fits all approach. Um, the case officers do not have a set of standard tick boxes just with yes, no answers. It's, it's a multifaceted process um, and, and the FCA will want to be flexible in its assessment according to what you're presenting to them as a proposal. And just to um, remind the point that I, I remind on the point that I mentioned earlier, you know, the FCA no longer has the appetite to coach applicants through the, through the application process. They're expecting firms increasingly to get their applications right first time. Um, in terms of how the assessment will work in, in practice, well, there's some key considerations set out there already um, on the slide, which hopefully echo what, what, what I've said already. Um, by no means are those three points there an exhaustive list. Um, so some, some other points to, to take into account um, when we're looking at this is, is that, you know, the FCA will be considering um, responsiveness of, uh, sorry, the, the um, responsiveness of firms when it sends questions out, the timeliness, the calibre of the response and the ability to articulate, the, the, the firm's ability to articulate its understanding of its obligations.
So all of this comes back to the, um, the, the, the sorts of things that we've spoken about before in terms of ready, willing and organised. Um, there will be questions from the FCA as it builds up a picture of the firm and hopefully moves towards the situation where ultimately it's able to say to you, um, we are now ready and we're now prepared to, to authorise you as a firm. So moving on to the sort of third limb of the, 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 the fundamentals of, of, of FCA authorisation. Um, so Johnny, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we've, we've talked about the, the need to be ready, willing and organised. We've talked about the threshold conditions and how they are looked at at the FCA. And then um, finally, here we have the principles for businesses. Um, so if you look at, um, if you like, the, the, the threshold conditions being the X axis and then the, the ready, willing and organised being the Y organised, uh, being the Y axis, um, then the principles sit across all of this. And, and rest assured, I'm not going to take you through um, all 11 of the principles. Um, suffice to say, they are, for the most part, sort of fairly easy um, bite-sized expectations um, that set out core uh, requirements from, from the FCA. So T uh, TCF, treating customers fairly, covered in principle six, as an example here, principle six customers' interests simply reads, a firm must pay due regard to the interests of its customers and treat them fairly. So th these are the sorts of things that um, we we're dealing with when we're looking at the principles. Um, all of those 11 principles are important, of course, and, and they need to be understood by firms approaching the FCA. Um, if I had to think about you know, the key ones for the purposes of, of authorizations, I would probably say that they're principle three, which covers management and control, um, principle four, which covers financial prudence, and principle 11, relations with regulators. And, and, and this comes back to the willingness part of, of ready, willing and organized. Coming down the line, we have um, the consumer duty. There is potential there that, that will add an additional um, principle to the 11th that are in existence. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on. Just before we move on to, to the next slide to look at the, the changes and trends in the authorization space, there are, there are three further things that I, you know, I can't really um, get away without mentioning. So just very briefly, um, as well as the, the, the RWO, the threshold conditions and the principles, other things that just about all firms are going to come up against are the senior managers and certification regime. Um, so in old money terms, that was the approved persons regime. And this is, um, as, as you'd expect, dealing with the question of which individuals, which key individuals within the firm are going to need to be um, registered, if you like, with the FCA uh, as part of the overall authorizations package. The FCA will expect firms to have effective governance structures um, in place, and that should be reflected um, in the SM. Uh, see applications that the firm makes alongside its application for authorization. Secondly, there is the, the notion um, of uh, the complete status of an application versus the incomplete status. Um, so quite simply here, the FCA will um, look at applications that come in and will form a judgment as to whether, based on both um, quantitative and qualitative criteria, they feel that the application is or isn't um, complete in its nature. The question of complete or incomplete then has a bearing on how long the, the, the FCA is given to determine an application under, um, under the legislation. So a complete application generally will need to be determined by the FCA within six months of receipt. Um, the FCA has afforded quite a lot more time, so up to uh, 12 months with, with an application that it deems to be incomplete. Um, Increasingly, the expectation has to be that where it sees a substantially incomplete application, rather than engaging with it, it's more likely to simply just send it back. Um, and, and the final point was, was the statutory deadlines, which I think I've sort of covered off there, talking about complete and incomplete status. So the FCA has afforded these, these statutory timeframes within which it is um, required to make its decisions and to, to determine these applications. Um, that can be a challenge um, for, for the FCA, and it's particularly in the context of case volumes, which I'll talk about soon. 
Um, it doesn't follow that if the FCA doesn't hit the deadline, that the firm is then automatically authorised. So the FCA does get into situations where, unfortunately, the um, the deadline is breached, and it usually will, will be for, for good reason. Um, that uh, is, is a question that the firm then has to consider, and, and, and essentially the only option for, for dealing with that is, is a judicial review instigated by the firm, which, you know, as we can probably expect for most um, for most firms, it's not practically uh, a realistic option. So um, moving on to the next slide, please, Jonathan, um, a quick look at the changes and challenges, um, what is happening, what we are seeing in the FCA authorization space. So the first three bullet points here, the transformation programme, the business plan um, for 2022 stroke 23, which was published last week by the FCA, and its stated aims to become more innovative, assertive and adaptive, as Jonathan talked about at the, at the top of the webinar. These can probably all be taken in, in one fell swoop. Um, so it was last year that the FCA in its earlier business plan voiced its determination to make some fundamental changes as part of a wider transformation. And really in the, um, in the, in the authorization space, the, the key here is that the FCA has said as part of this, um, that firstly, it wants to create a more robust gateway. So it wants to make um, gaining authorization more difficult. And again, Jonathan touched upon um, the increasing number of cases that are being refused or, or where firms are being um, told that they ought to withdraw their application. Um, and the inference is that you know, what passed before, what was good enough in, in, in earlier applications may no longer um, be good enough now. So this is another um, example of the FCA's flexibility in its approach to assessing authorization. Um, so in its, recent, uh, in its recent business plan suite, uh, the FCA included a, a three-year strategy um, that will take it forward to 2025. And the sorts of things that we're able to, to glean from the information that was published last week is that, that generally the FCA is being tougher on firms that want authorization to operate in the UK. Um, it has increased its efforts to stop firms with in, inadequate harm prevention controls from entering UK markets. So obviously that has another direct bearing on the question of authorization. Um, the FCA has recruited recently, or is in the process of recruiting 95 further colleagues to work in its authorizations division. And that includes two newly appointed authorizations directors who, who um, were, were appointed a couple of weeks ago. So you know, resources being placed into the authorization arena to, to gear the, the, the FCA up to do um, what it says it wants to do in this space. It's easy to see which, which direction um, things are moving. The next point that I wanted to, to talk about is FCA decision making. And, and what I'm talking about here um, is decision making specifically on applications where the FCA feels that refusal um, should be the appropriate outcome. So just by way of background um, on this, the, um, the process for refusal can be um, quite long, quite drawn out, quite labor intensive. Um, it will include uh, issuing a number of, of statutory notices to firms as it moves to, as the FCA moves towards reaching a final decision um, on refusing an application. In November of, of last year, the FCA announced that it had made some certain reforms to its decision-making framework. Um, and it's very clear from the information that the FCA published back then as to what this was geared towards. So if I look at some of the key words that, that came out here, it has reformed its decision-making process to make faster and more effective decisions. And this has been done as part of its transformation and in particular um, as part of its drive to be more innovative and assertive. And in particular, um, it enables these decisions to be made more quickly. So what in effect has happened here is that um, a lot of decisions that would previously have to go to uh, a committee of, of, of the FCA have now been handed to senior managers within the organisation to enable the, the, the FCA to be more fleet of foot um, in relation to getting these decisions made, getting them turned around and getting them uh, communicated to firms. 
the penultimate bullet on, on this slide talks about the uh, what we've seen recently of the, the examples of the FCA making expe its expectations clearer. Um, so there's a couple of, of very good examples of that happening recently, both in um, January of this year. So the, SMA, uh, the, the FCA issued a document around its expectations regarding um, the appointment of SMF 16 and 17 um, approved individuals to, to firms. So this is the compliance oversight and anti-money laundering functions. Um, this felt like a little bit of a break with tradition. So the FCA coming out and saying, okay, look, we are seeing um, a number of instances or a number of examples of things going on when we're looking at applications, which we are not altogether comfortable with. So that being the case, we're gonna issue some guidance to you, which tells you what our expectations are. And in this particular um, publication, as I say, back in January, talked about um, expectations around competency and capability of individuals performing these key roles within firms, and also uh, covering the question of what sort of training experience um, they may be expected to have, and the FCA's views on third party support and capacity. Um, so that last point there being particularly around, okay, if you're going to carry on this role for a firm, do you clearly have the capacity and the time to do it relative to anything else that may be going on in your professional world? Um, another example of, of the FCA making its, uh, its expectations clear, although perhaps geared towards a, a rather more limited audience on this occasion, um, firms in the temporary permissions regime at the moment. So, so the FCA sub, um, published a document earlier in January to say, what it was planning to do with firms that didn't meet its expectations and, and in that case a fairly sort of black and white account of the action that the FCA would take um, with those firms that couldn't meet threshold conditions and didn't like the, didn't look likely to be authorised. Finally here I just wanted to say um, a, a bit about the, um, the practicalities so the current application volumes at the FCA and, 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 and the implications there. So um, the, the FCA is being quite open um, about this. It is seeing unprecedented um, application volumes. And you know, I think that alongside a number of other organizations is probably um, experiencing a certain level of, of, of retention challenges as well as everybody sort of faces the, the, the prospect of going back to work post lockdown. Um, the, the upshot of all of that is that there are um, delays in allocating cases to case officers in various parts of, of, of the FCA's authorizations division at present. Um, it was recently sort of put out that the FCA has something in the order of 9,000 applications currently um, on its plate. Now, not all of those will be applications from firms seeking um, authorization. There will be um, individual approval applications covered in that as well. But I mean, that's, that's a fairly hefty number to obviously have to get through, hence the uh, reference earlier to the recruitment the FTA is doing. Um, they do have a plan in place to, as they put it, um, burn down, so to get through these applications, but it's gonna take time. Um, so that plan of work is, is not expected to start delivering um, noticeable results until the second half of this year. And hopefully this information will be of particular interest to the 54% of you who've said that you are planning to put applications in within the next 12 months. Depending on what your sort of timings are and your lead-in plans are, you know, that's something that you should factor into your, plan, in, into your planning. Okay. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Next slide. So that, that's a very quick um, overview of the sorts of things that we're seeing happening in the authorization space at the moment and what are the implications of this what does it all mean um well i think for the most part um th they're covered here on the on the slide scrutiny is only going to increase it's only going to go in that direction and, and the fca makes no um, apology for the fact that authorization um is going to be tougher we mentioned earlier that um, the focus is going to move or has moved to looking at the entirety of a firm's business. Um, we know that in specific 
um, parts of, of applications, the, the, the FCA is um, adding more focus, so greater scrutiny of financial stability, and also wanting to understand what wind down plans may look like. Um, we've talked about the uh, greater propensity to re just reject incomplete applications. Um, and obviously, uh, finally, the, the, the FCA will be looking at the quality of the applications that comes its way. So, you know, is it looking at documents that simply replay their own rules back to them? If so, then that really doesn't get us anywhere. The FCA wants to know, wants to understand how firms are going to meet um, the rules that will apply to them. Next slide, please, Jonathan. A very quick um, touch on the, the changes to the authorization fee structure that took place uh, in January of this year. Um, typically, uh, fees uh, tend to sit now in the, uh, the sort of £2,500 space for, for the majority of straightforward advisor and arranger firms. But, you know, the fee range now goes from 250 through to 200000 um, There are 10 categories of um, a fee now, and the idea was that this uh, this new arrangement provides more transparency, um, but also, as the um, FCA explained in its rationale for change when it when it publicised this, most of the application fees haven't changed for for nearly twenty years. So it's not really that surprising that the the FCA moved to to revise these recently. Um, and then finally, next slide, please, um, please, Jonathan, a, a quick look. Um, at what we think is is coming down the line. Um, the first couple of points here are probably not coming down the line. They're, they're already with us. Um, sanctions firms are not surprisingly expected in the, uh, the current global situation to have robust systems and controls in place to counter the risk that they might be used to further financial crime. Um, and that would include compliance with any financial sanctions obligations. Um, the FCA will, will be looking at that, not only for the firms that are on, in, in their fold at the moment, the, but for firms coming their way. Um, operational resilience, again, you know, that's here now post-COVID. It's not surprising that the, the, the FCA has an interest in the ability of firms um, to prevent and adapt and respond to changes that, that, that may arise as a result of operational disruption. Um, Bullet point three, we, we, we can inevitably, I think, expect to see a greater focus on ESG going forward. Um, back in November, the FCA made the point that they aim to embed climate and wider ESG considerations in everything that they do. Um, and at that time also, they, they published a strategy for positive change around their ESG priorities. So there is inevitably going to be um, further focus on that as, as firms start to um, approach the FCA for authorization. Diversity and inclusion, the FCA has, has, has published a number of documents in the past on the role of uh, d and in financial services and, and their view um, on why it matters. Uh, indeed, only yesterday it published PS 22 stroke three, um, diversity and inclusion on company boards and executive management. Um, so although that has a, a relatively limited audience at the moment, they're, they're saying there that these measure, measures are aimed to improve transparency on the diversity of certain company boards and their executive management. The, the FCA consumer du duty, which I, I touched on very briefly earlier on, um, likely to um, result in a further principle to add to the 11 in place. There's already been um, two consultations made by the FCA in relation to this. You know, and what they've said in summary is they see a range of good practice by firms in, in, in various sectors, innovating to meet customers' needs, but they also see that firms are not consistently and sufficiently prioritising good customer outcomes. So they, they want to um, tighten that up. They want more work done on that to um, drive uh, firms towards delivering better outcomes. And finally, various regulatory initiatives. I mean, you know, this, this is not a world that ever just stand still, change is inevitable and, and the various things um, touched in, on in the bullet points above are covered in um, the FCA's regulatory initiatives grid, um, which is a 45 page document which talks about the various things that the FCA um, is working on and looking at implementing. Um, so perhaps most of relevance in, in this space is 
um, the review of the appointed representatives regime, but it's, it's something that's worth monitoring, worth tracking. So that's me. Um, hopefully that uh, has given you a, a useful overview of what's happening in the world of FCA authorization. And um, I'll hand back over to, uh, to Johnny. Thanks, Richard. That was incredibly detailed. I'm sure our audience found it uh, absolutely invaluable. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Paniotis to carry on today's discussion. Yes. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, everybody. Let's have a look at the changes of the capital requirements that were brought to investment firms. When applying for a new authorization, it's important to know what the regulator is expecting in terms of capital requirements. The new investment firm regulation that was enacted as of beginning of 2000. In 22, changed the way the requirements are calculated that affected the business plus structure and other financial reporting requirements. The IFPR, as we call it, applies to MIFID investment firms that are authorized and regulated by FCA, collective portfolio management investment firms, and regulated and unregulated hoarding companies of groups that contain either of the above. The IFPR does not apply to part designated investment firms. They will remain subject to prudential supervision by the PAR. Next slide. Now, the key aspects of the new prudential regime, which includes among others, the new classification system, the new variable capital on the K-factors methodology, the introduction of the new liquidity requirements that is applicable to all investment firms, the regulatory reporting under the new framework, the risk management procedures that the firm should follow, the prudential consolidation, and finally, the remuneration policies and practices that are under the new investment firm's regime. This new regime's approach will be conceptually the same under the previous regulatory framework, we will still have three pillars that include the basic requirements of home funds and liquid assets at the first pillar, the additional home funds calculated following the application of the new ICARA, as we call the ICAP now, and the last pillar, which is related to the market discipline, the public disclosures or the pillar three. Next slide. Now, the, under the new prudential regime, there are three different initial capital amounts depending on the MIFID service each investment firm provides. Initially, the investment firms, which are authorized to offer the dealing on account, the underwriting or placing of financial instruments on a firm commitment basis will be required 750 pounds. Whereas the requirements for other investment firms that are no authorization to offer these services would be required to get to have 75,000 and the remaining uh, 150,000. Next slide. Now, the investment firms are now categorized into small and non interconnected investment firms and non small and non interconnected investment firms. SNIs and not SNIs, as we call them for short. In order to be classified as an SNI investment firm and benefit from less prudential requirements, an investment firm should meet all of the criteria presented in this table here. An investment firm which breaches any of the criteria should be classified as a non SNI investment firm and comply with full provisions of the IFPR regime. Also have in mind that in case that the investment firm, which at any point of time no longer meets any of the, con all of the conditions, not any, it shall cease to be considered as a small and non-interconnected investment firm with immediate effect after reforming FCA for the fact. Next slide. Now, as regards the initial capital requirements, we are have uh, various uh, classes, as we said, uh, between SNIs and non-SNIs. 
with the calorie requirements and the initial capital is in line with the authorization license. Now, the risk based capital is basically the, what we are going to uh, talk in the next slides the calculation method of the K factors and the fixed overhead requirements according to SNI or non SNI categorization. Also, we are going to have uh, separate requirements as regards the large exposures, liquidity, consolidation requirements, as well as the reporting. And we are presenting this table, the MIFI Pro uh, sections that for your convenience, you can actually have a look on your own. Next slide. Now, as regards to the risk based capital that we talk about for each investment firm under the new potential regulatory framework, the SNI investment firms will be required to maintain all funds of at least the highest between the new permanent capital and fixed overheads, while the non SNI's investment firm will take in consideration the calorie requirements for the key factors as well. Next slide. The fixed overhead requirements will be uh, is calculated as one quarter of the investment firm's fixed overheads of the previous year based on the audited financial statements. In order to calculate the respective fixed overheads of the previous year, the latest audited figure should be used and any eligible variable uh, expense such as the remuneration variable, um, profit shares, share commissions, and payables, fees payables uh, will be deducted from the overall expense in order to, to calculate the capital requirements. Next slide. Okay, so as we said, the risk based capital is actually dependent on the new K factors requirements that will replace the current credit risk, market risk, and operational risk to calibrate the capital that is required to cover the pillar one risk as we have them now. The respective capital requirements of the K factor methodology will be the sum of the risk to client, risk to market, and risk to firm proxies. However, non SNIs will only need to apply the K factors that are relevant to their business model. For example, the risk to market and risk to firm will only be applicable for firms that are permitted to deal as principal. Thus, the firms that have no authorization for the dealing account will only need to calculate the risk to clients proxy to determine their K factor requirements. Next slide. Okay, so we said about the three proxies of the K factors, risk to clients, risk to market, and risk to firm. The risk to client proxy is the sum of four different K factors. The asset under management, the client's money held, the assets administrate, and client orders handled, where the risk to market will be either the K, the, uh, the K factor, the, the net position risk, and the clearing margin given, even uh, either of the two, provided that the clearing margin is permitted by the regulator. Whereas for the risk to firm, it's a sum of the other factors, that is the trading counterparty default, and that is basically the sum of the K factors boxes you see here on the table. Next slide. Okay, so as part of the license application, the investment firms should submit the following potential related documents. That is the capital and liquidity analysis as part of the business plan, the MIFI Pro supplement form, and the ICARA process report that is only for the non SNI investment firms. Therefore, the ICARA is the new ICAP that we know as so far, which is applicable to all investment firms now. And that starts from their application. Next slide. So as part of this capital and liquidity analysis included in the business plan documents, the applicants should take into account the firm's financial position for the first three to five years following the license application approval by incorporating the business plan in the projected business balance sheets and the 
of the loss. Also, the documents must also include calculations of their own funds requirements under the MIFID Pro 4, that is, the higher the permanent capital fixed overheads or if uh, applicable, the K factors, a summary of all fund threshold requirements under the MIFID Pro 7, that is, the FCA expects to find detailed calculations in the firm's ICARA report, detailed calculations of capital tiers, the cleared showing calculations between the uh, own funds and the details of the assumptions that were used for these calculations. Next slide. Now, the key questions asked by the FCA through this MIFID Pro supplement form would be uh, like whether the investment firm is an SNI or a non-SNI, confirming the credit of the company breaches to be categorized as non-SNI, to state whether the firm will meet the definition of a significant non-SNI firm that will be required to establish these additional firm committees, that is uh, the remuneration, the nomination, and the risk, their group structure, and confirm whether the group will fall under prudential consolidation supervision, minimum initial capital requirements and own funds composition, to confirm that all required financial information are attached with the obligation, and the ICARA, the internal capital adequacy and risk assessment process. As we said previously, it is the new ICAP report. Next slide. Now, as part of the authorization application, the non SNI investment firms are required to submit the ICARA process report. Moreover, the FCA may request from SNI investment firms to submit their ICAP documents as well. The ICARA process report should reflect at least the following the business model strategy, that is a clear description of the firm's business model and strategy, the activities of the firm, an explanation of the activities that it carries out and with a focus on the most material activities, the appropriateness of the ICARA, an explanation of why it has conduct, it was concluded, its ICARA is fit for purpose, the explanation is required of the deficiencies identified, the steps, to be taken to remedy them and who is responsible for implementing any actions. The stress testing, a summary of the stress testing and reverse stress testing it has carried out. The effectiveness of the risk management process, analysis of the effectiveness of the risk management process during the period covered by the review. The overall financial adequacy rule, the OFR, that is the new concept, that is explanation of how it is complying with the offer, a clear breakdown at the review date of the available loan funds, available liquid assets, and its assessment of its threshold requirements. The wind down planning that is incorporated in the ICARA, an overview of its wind down planning, including any key assumptions or qualifications. And finally, the material harm identification and mitigation. That is a summary of the material harms it has identified and steps taken to mitigate. Therefore, this is an overview of the business model assessment and the capital and liquidity planning. That is Aliotas, for me. Aliotas, thank you so much for covering that for us. Really appreciate yes. it. And, and it was equally as informative as Richard's section. So Thank you. now I will um, open up to questions and this now concludes the formal presentation section of the webinar. And um, we have had a lot of questions come in. Um, we've been tracking them and a lot of them actually seem quite specific to individual firms and firms that are going through authorizations at the moment. So if we can't answer those, I don't have time to answer those on the webinar today. If it's okay, we actually may give you a phone call and try to talk you through those questions in, in person. But um, let, let's go through a few, as many as we can now, because I know we're, we're coming up to time. So um, how do you determine the initial capital to be injected to support a, an application? Panios, I think this is one for you here. Um, okay, that's a good question. The applicant should take into consideration not only the regulatory requirements as we have described them, but also the projected losses until the firm starts generating revenues. 
for the purpose of determination of the initial capital to be injected, the firm should consider the aggregate losses generated um, up to this point and to, to be generated in the coming months until the break-even point and take into consideration the basic and additional capital liquidity requirements calculated following the application of the process of the ICARA. Thanks, Paniatis. I've actually noticed we've got, we've got a few questions that I think we could um, cover off for you to answer. So I'll ask them quickly and then I'll go to questions for Richard afterwards. Um, the next one would be, um, should an applicant include additional capital and liquidity requirement information in the business plan? Uh, that's for me again, you guys? Right? Yeah, I think okay. there's, there's a few questions. They, We're going to go through the ones I think okay. that are for you first and then we'll go to Richard sure. afterwards. Sure, no problem. Okay, so uh, should the applicant include additional capital? Okay, now in the business plan, the applicant should include at least the financial projections information, as well as the capital and liquid analysis for the basic regulatory requirements only. Additional information regarding the capital and liquidity additional requirements from the ongoing activities, as well as to ensure an orderly wind down plan should be included and described in the ICARA process documents. Thank you. Um, now, actually, you mentioned wind down plan. There's also another question on wind down planning here. Um, how do you create wind down planning for a new firm? Okay. For, for, uh, for a newly established investment firm, the business plan, the projection submittance <coughs> part of the authorization application should be used for the estimation of the wind down plan. Of course, since the firm is still at the beginning of its operations, the assumptions as well as the figures to be used should be should take into consideration the size, the nature, the scale of the investment firm, and the assumptions to be used should be adjusted in accordance with the short life of the firm. Thanks, Paniatos. And um, let's uh, let's ask let's find through the questions here one more for you, and then we'll go to Richard. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Mifid Pro supplement form, the FCA asks the, the applicant to specify the date it prefers to submit the MIF007 uh, and the ICARA questionnaire. Do you have any suggestions on this or any comments on, on, on how okay. to answer the supplement? So, so this is MIF007, that is and the, the ICARA. ICARA, yeah. Yes. Now, all investment firms are required to submit this return to FCA on an annual basis via REC data portal in an XML format. The new ICARA questionnaire will be asking questions related to the basis of ICARA, that is whether solo or whether consolidated or unconsolidated basis, the key dates such as reference dates, review dates and submission dates, the own funds composition, the threshold requirements, additional capital and liquidity requirements, or even questions related to the wind down plan, and of course, questions regarding the firm's business model. Now, it is advisable to set the suggested submission date at least two to three months following the finalization of the audited financial statements for each year to ensure that the firm has adequate time to prepare or update the ICARA process report. Thank you very much, Paniata. So I think this next one would be for, for Richard. Um, for, for the compliance oversight function, would you say um, one's educational background, for instance, professional qualifications or university degree uh, or master's degree is critical to obtain an FCA approval? Uh, would it be more difficult to get an approval for the for the role for someone with extensive compliance experience but no professional or education qualification? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I wouldn't say that the, certainly I wouldn't say that the, the academic qualification side of things would be critical. Um, what this question goes to the very heart of is the, the information that the FCA published back in January, um, which in effect is a guidance sheet, if you like. So the FCA has set out its stall there in terms of generally what it sees as working in, in the space for SMF 16s and 17s. And where it comes out is saying 
you know, broadly speaking, we see a combination of relevant professional training and relevant um, prior experience as being the sort of ideal mix for successful applications. By implication, it doesn't go on to say, well, actually, you know, if you've only got qualifications, you're not going to make it. And if you've only got experience, you're not going to make it. Firms need to um, take a step back and think about the nature of the role um, that they're looking to appoint the individual for. Um, and it's then open to them to make a case to the FCA as to why that individual's combination of, of experience and, and, and qualifications, if, if indeed there are um, qualifications, make that person suitable. Thanks, Richard. So an, another question here. Under PRIN, um, how much should you anticipate the consumer duty PRIN 12 and the new rules? Um, I think my brief answer to that, Jonathan, would be very much. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the <laughs> FCA has had two consultations around the consumer duty. Um, we know that there are going to be changes coming in the summer. So the FCA has already flagged that there are likely to be handbook rule changes um, and the possibility of that further principle that I mentioned. So I think if you're preparing an application for authorization at the moment, um, my advice, my guidance would be take full account of what the what has been said about the consumer duty um, and reflect that in your application, you know, indicate, make it clear to the FCA that you're aware that this is coming, that you have thought about how it will apply to your business and talk about what sorts of things will be happening in your business to reflect those obligations coming down the line. Um, for me, that's a perfect example of how you demonstrate to the FCA that you are ready to be authorised. Perfect. Um, I, I know we've overrun, so maybe just a couple more questions, if that's OK, with both the, the presenters here today. Uh, on the complete and incomplete timelines, do these also apply where a firm may be dual regulated by both the PRA and the FCA, or are there other SLAs in place? Yeah, those, those timelines apply in, in both instances. So if you are a firm that is going to be um, dual regulated, so if you're going to be um, covered under the respective umbrellas of both the PRA and the FCA, um, then in, in fact your application is made primarily to the PRA um, and the PRA and the FCA will liaise with each other on your application um, looking at the respective <laughs> Parts that they are interested in, but um, the statutory timeframes that I spoke about would be the same and would apply in those circumstances. Thanks. Um, uh, do you know how long the FCA is typically taking to process applications at the moment? And this person is particularly interested, actually, more in a variation, an application for a variation of permissions rather than for a direct newer authorization application. Um, we do have some information from the FCA, quite helpful, around typically how long different processes are taking at the moment. Um, I have to be honest here and say off the top of my head, um, I can't recall exactly where um, things are with VOPs. But I mean, if, if the questioner wants to drop me an email afterwards, I'll very happily uh, look into it and come back with um, a quick email on, on my understanding of the current position. Um, Suffice to say, it's the, 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 the lead-in period, so the, the period between submission and, and a case finding its way to a case officer varies according to um, which department and which sort of transaction we're talking about. I know, for example, on um, changing control cases that the FCA has gone so far as to put a note on its website to talk about the lead-in times there. Thank you. Um, for the SMF3, are there any qualifications and or education needed to be appointed? Um, no formal um, qualifications. I mean, the SMF3 is an executive director function. Um, you know, clearly the, the landscape is going to um, vary there across the, the, the question of the type of firm that the FCA is looking at, but there will be current executive directors out there who are able to um, demonstrate that for the type of firm that we're talking about, their experience uh, in that space is sufficient to, to make them a reasonable candidate for that role. And, and, and then in other 
uh, in other walks of life where perhaps the underlying business is more technical in nature, um, the, the, the likelihood is that uh, as part of that individual's career progression, they've picked up um, professional qualifications on the way. Thanks, Richard. Um, not a question, actually, but someone has, has posted something to share. Um, so not sure what, what firm type they are, but they've said uh, we've seen very lengthy delays in SMF applications and feedbacks. The FCA SLA is 12 weeks, but they're taking considerably longer. So that's what one of uh, the participants in today's webinar has said. Um, just looking through the question to see if we could potentially ask one or two more. With location, what about UK branches? What do we need to consider, uh, including um, relation to the parent? Um. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, actually, because um, the, the, the <laughs> issue of overseas firms and UK branches is another example of an area where the FCA has set its thinking out quite clearly. Um, so what I'm going to make mention of here is a document that it, that it published last year called Our Approach to International Firms um, that was published in February of, of last year, I think. Quite a... a quite a clear and quite a readable document, I would say. And, and, and in chapter three, it talks about its general expectations of, of international firms, but also talks about the, the options of uh, either applying to the FCA as a branch or creating a, a UK subsidiary. So first and foremost, the question will um, vary or the answer will vary according to the option that the firm takes up. If it, if it decides to establish a UK subsidiary, um, then the normal considerations around um, making an application threshold conditions, all the things I spoke about will apply. Um, things will vary very slightly in the case of um, a branch. And, and my, my best advice there, um, better than any answer I could give here, would be to, to go and have a look at that approach document. As I say, February 2021, have a look at Chapter 3, and I think it will answer any questions that you have in that space. Okay, let's let's do one last question. Yeah, um, we're looking to apply for direct authorization for the employee benefits for an employee benefits firm. Will there be any allowance for that from the FCA's application um, view? I'm I'm not aware um, that there's any particular dispensation or allowance in relation to. Um, firms looking to undertake employee benefits work per se and, and, and obviously everything that I spoke about earlier talked about um, <clears throat> things becoming more difficult rather than less difficult. Um, I think the, a, a little bit of context on this question, I think that this is a firm that's currently operating as an appointed representative and looking to become Directly correct. I've had a few messages regarding the, this 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 firm here. Um, yeah. So I think if the it. question is, you know, will, will there be any allowance given um, for the fact that the firm has a has a track record as an appointed representative? Um, the answer to that is, well, formally, um, no. The, 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 the FCA won't look at it and say okay, um, but it does inevitably, I think, take some reassurance that okay, well, here here is a firm that is already operating already, uh, albeit under the umbrella of another regulated firm. Um, so we, you know, we, we have expectations that this firm perhaps has a better understanding of the practicalities of day-to-day -day compliance than some, some brand new startup. Um, but because the firm is moving from under the umbrella of another firm to standing on its own two feet um, in its own right, then the FCA is gonna want to be sure um, that once the, the relationship is severed, nothing is going to happen that is going to cause any, uh, any, any problems. Richard, would you be happy taking on one last question in, in returns to D, in, in relation to DNI? Yeah, try. Yeah. Okay, so we've had a question come in. This is the last one we're going to ask here today. And if, it, if everyone's questions we've had to miss, unfortunately, due to time, um, we will respond to you either by phone or by email. Uh, so this question is, the insurance industry, particularly broking, is awash with boards full of white middle-aged men. How are the FCA going to tackle their ambition of improving diversity and inclusion? Um, yeah, I, I understood. And I, I think that um, the, the FCA and, and, and wider society has its work cut out um, 
in tackling the the issue that you've you've articulated there. It's certainly not going to be something that can be um, achieved overnight. You know, the, there's going to be a longer term goal here. But the, you know, the, the FCA um, is quite adept, I would say, at starting to set out quite clearly and quite firmly what its expectations of firms are. Um, it may so may do that in something like a discussion paper to begin with, to uh, get people thinking about the the issue. But moving down the line, it's likely to then um, have a change of tack and move on from a discussion to, uh, dr- a discussion led um, initiative to um, mandating certain activity across firms. Um, you know, not only in the space of, of, of DNI but also. Um, anyway, where it feels that you know positive change is required. So, quite a long-winded answer, but I think in in, in summary, um, if the FCA in the future feels that it needs to, um, it will lay down mandatory expectations of firms regarding um, its DNI approach regarding things like recruitment and promotion, those sorts of things. Thanks, Richard. So. Um, unfortunately, we can't do any more questions. Um, I'd like to let everyone know in this webinar that Compliant Work can assist firms with their FCA applications. We can project manage an application from start to finish or can review an application you put together ahead of its submission. We're on hand to help respond to FCA queries once an application has been submitted and can also provide the compliance documentation needed by the firm on an ongoing basis. If you want to discuss uh, an FCA authorization or any other compliance support services, please can you send me an email or give me a call. My details are on the screen now. Uh, again, name Jonathan Greenstein. Um, I'd like to thank all of the attendees on today's webinar uh, for joining us for this really interesting discussion. Also, I'd like to thank Richard and Panayotis for, for leading the discussion here today. And um, this webinar has been recorded and we'll be putting the recording online soon. Please follow ComplyBot on LinkedIn to see when this becomes available to watch. Thank you and hope everyone has a very good day.